sprayers? Yeah, I talked to Pat this morning, and Pat had to, she went to get some stents, and they weren't able to do them, and so she's now got to consider what kind of surgery they're going to do. She's at home, she's fine. She'll be here Tuesday for Bible study. She just okay. because she loses those crutches, she didn't feel like walking with her arms today. So, yeah, so she's doing okay. All right, okay. AJ's going to leave. Yep, yeah, let's stay there. We got somebody really special in our church who's had a birthday Friday. And so we're, we're going to sing to Jack. He's now joined the 70s club. And so we're good. So please join me in singing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy Number 580, King, lead out on King Eternal. If you're going to sing, we ask that you do wear your mask. James. It's in the third chapter. It begins with the 13th verse. It goes into the to uh, the third is the third chapter. 13th verse goes into the fourth chapter. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they have come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks. Thank you. Friends, this morning we'll affirm our faith. It's with a different affirmation than we typically use. It's the statement of faith from the United Church of Canada, which is like the Methodist Church there. As you're able, would you stand as we affirm our faith together this morning? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. seated. As we prepare to pray together this morning, we'll be singing, Oh Master, let me walk with thee. And uh, you're welcome to come forward and pray at the prayer rest if you want. Gracious God, we come before you humbly, broken, afraid, confused, misdirected. And then we read in the scripture from James that we don't get what we ask because we don't ask rightly. So today, in humbleness, we come before you to ask for healing for our friends, relatives, church members, and others that are hurting. Whether they have physical illness or mental fears or spiritual confusion, God, we know that you're the great physician. We ask for your healing touch. And we ask that knowing that we have failed. We fall short. 
We're not very good at our Christian walk. We want to be better. But sometimes our own thinking gets in the way. We want to understand the details when all you ask us to do is have faith. We want to be able to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and all you want us to do is believe. So confessing our failures, confessing the ways in which we get in the way of your Holy Spirit, we open our hearts so that the songs we sing, the words to those songs reach our hearts. The scriptures we read, those words reach through the hard crust of our physical self and change us. We live in a confusing, chaotic time. But so did Jesus. We look at His life and we realize that it was never about Him. It was about His call to ministry. It was about His call to bring salvation to a hurting world. And we really do desire to be more like that and less like the creature that's created by this chaotic and sometimes hurtful world. The disciples gathered around Jesus and asked Him, how do we pray? And He said this. He said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to hear from the Gospel of Mark this morning, A.J. is going to lead us. You may remain seated until the very end, A.J., and then if you'd have them stand, we're going to sing, Open My Eyes That I May See.
reading from the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another of who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. Taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And you may be seated. So I entitled this message today, Me, 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 Me. Me. And maybe another me. And it comes from both of these scriptures. You remember back when I was reading from James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish. Me, me, me. Turn on the news. It's all about somebody, but it's never about the group. There's one faction over here, they're going to argue, it's all that there has to be there. there yesterday, there were people uh, in all different kind of places protesting. And the people in the protest, oh, they're unified all right, but it's all about what they want. I could even get a little picky about our legislators right now because there is no working together. It's all about what they want. That's the world we live in right now. And when you leave out of here and go out into the world, that's the world, the world wants you to be on one side or the other. Even within the Christian faith, we've got all of these arguments between the Baptists and the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians, and I'll forget some names of the rest of them, about who's right. And even in Jesus' time, these disciples are going along arguing who's the greatest. One of the other Gospels says they really want to know who's going to sit on his right and who's going to sit on his left. Now, I don't know where we get a model for life like this if we don't go to the Scriptures. Never in the short time that Jesus did his ministry on this planet did he ever put himself first. Well, you might argue, well, he went into the temple and he was mad and he turned over the tables, but it wasn't about him, it was about God. Never did he put himself first. Jesus did not go in front of Pontius Pilate or anywhere else and say, it's about me. Even when they went so far as to say, are you really the king of the Jews? And he said, that's what you say. Where do we get a model into surviving in this chaotic world we live in if it isn't from Jesus Christ? Contention and argument, sometimes fighting, those things aren't of God. That's not the way God does it. Oh, we'd be much more comfortable if He would. We, we sang that first song this morning, Lead on, O King Eternal. We, we'd be much more comfortable if God would just get on a big horse and go straighten it all out. A big sword, you know, and just wipe the ones out that weren't doing what He wanted. Unfortunately, most of us would be gone too. I mean, we, we really do need to just confess that we have not been living the way God projected or taught that we should live. I'm raising my hand. I'm not expecting you to raise yours. 
Don't put me up as an icon of somebody that does everything and thinks everything right. I have the same dastardly and screwed up thoughts that everybody else has. And there are, there's a selfishness about me that once in a while I just wish they'd make me king for a day. <laughs> I could fix some of this stuff, but it wouldn't be all of it. And it'd still be a mess when it was over. And we, anytime we lean on any one human being to fix it, we're going to be disappointed. Actually, even on a group of human beings, it seems we're going to be disappointed. So we have the scriptures and they serve a purpose. They lead us to understand that what's important to Jesus is not our understanding, but our faith. We live in this world. When I first became a preacher, this was back 20 years ago, there was a movement going on called the uh, Historical Jesus Movement. And you still see some of that on the History Channel from time to time. And these people, they're wanting to believe in Jesus, but they want to be able to find some evidence. They're looking for James's bone box or, or some other kind of evidence. Even Constantine, back in 300, he was looking for evidence. His mama was a believer. He wasn't a believer. She told him, said, look, put Christian symbols on your swords and your crosses and you'll win. And they did. But he didn't confess himself a believer in Christ till he was on his deathbed. Because he had so much fear that he would fall short that his salvation would be removed. He confessed it only on his deathbed. Friends, don't wait for that because we don't know when that day comes. I'm assuming, sometimes wrongly, that everybody in the room has already made that confession. But maybe not. And I know some people would say, well, you have to do it a certain way. You have to kneel on a certain knee. You have to say certain words. That's all baloney. All you have to do is trust that Jesus Christ is a Savior and confess it to Him. You don't have to tell me. Now, it's useful to tell it in front of the church because then you have accountability. We're supposed to hold each other accountable, right? Even Jesus describes that. He says, if somebody strays from the flock and they're doing wrong, he has a recipe for that. He says, go to them individually and say, hey, dude, what's up? And if that doesn't work, well, then you get two or three other brothers and sisters. You go see them and you say, look, we've observed this. We notice this. You don't embarrass them or tell them they're wrong or anything until you've exhausted every other effort. Then you take them before the church. And even then, your hope is that they will switch. I don't see that accountability in the church. I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I got sober through AA long before I met Kathy. She's never known me when I drank. And uh, what AA is, you know, if, if anybody in here knows the traditions of AA, it's an anonymous deal. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous stands for. You're not supposed to reveal anybody else that's there. But I can reveal myself all I want, right? And so I've never made it a practice to be very secret about it. Well, at the very beginning, when I became a preacher, they asked me at the Board of Ministry, they said, are you going to share your experience in Alcoholics Anonymous with the church? I said, I don't know. Because there's a lot of judgment. I, I was next in line to get this job one time as a pharmaceutical sales rep for veterinary supplies. Man, to me, I thought that'd be the king of all jobs. You know, I could go call on veterinarians who mostly went to A&M, and I like Aggies. I could go talk about dogs, cats. I really kind of like dogs and cats. And I thought it was going to be great. I made it to the last interview, and the guy says, tell me about your community involvement. I said, well, I work with the Boy Scouts. I work with the church, and I go to Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, interview over. We don't hire drunks. Oh. Oh my so you don't know who you can really tell stuff to. And I didn't talk a lot about it. For years, I would say I used to work. I worked in psych hospitals. I did work with drug addicts and alcoholics and all that stuff. It was truth. I just didn't go into all the detail. And so I was at a different church serving, and I invited the guys from the wheelhouse, which is a recovery place over in Deer Park, to come to church. And they did. And one of the really sweet, kind, 
ladies came up to me after church and said, do we really want them in our church? Then I decided I was going to talk about it. I said, I'm one of them. Oh, well, we didn't meet you. <laughs> you see, that's the kind of stuff James is talking about here. We're not called to save each other. <laughs> we're called to save the people that aren't here. And we're not going to attract them by going out and telling them they're wrong or they're going to hell. We're going to attract them by going out and showing them what love looks like. And it's hard. There's people that live in lifestyles I don't agree with. I don't have to like them, but I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to care about their salvation. So over the years, I, I have, have struggled with this not very much, but what happened was after I kind of came out of the closet about my alcoholism only, I'm, I'm straight, folks. <laughs> when, I, when I revealed my situation about that, one day I went to eat at a, at a place and I pulled up and I parked because I haven't been in a liquor store. I've been in a liquor store now one time in 32 years. And that was since Christmas or since tax time. That's the only time I hadn't been. And so I, I don't think about where I parked. So I parked my truck. I used to have a, a Dodge Ram 1500. I mean, it was kind of the only one like it around. And I parked it and I apparently parked in front of the liquor store. And later that afternoon, I got some calls up at the church said, hey, are you okay? I noticed you were parked in front of a liquor store. <laughs> That's accountability. Right? Somebody cared enough about me to ask if I was okay. I don't go to the horse races, dog races, or the casinos because I don't want you to see me there. Because that makes it okay, right? If the preacher goes. I have to set an example or want to or choose to set an example that is a little bit better than who I really am inside because I got to tell you the times I went to the dog races I had a blast. <laughs> I'm not at risk of spending all the money I have for anything at a casino because I don't really like to gamble but I like to watch people but I don't go to those places because well I might see you there. <laughs> when I used to shop a lot at Gurland's, when I lived in Deer Park, it would be funny to get behind somebody, one of our church members in the in the uh, line, you know, and they'd have their basket full of wine and beer and stuff, and, and I'm going to stand behind them for the paper. And they'd look around and say, oh, and they try to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have an alcohol problem, I'm not worried about you drinking, okay? And if you do have an alcohol problem, I can help you get help. But James gives us this recipe that, that involves things like peace and gentleness and kindness. And then Jesus puts it in maybe more clear words, but to us they may be not clear when he says, the first must be last and be a servant of all. And if you don't take up your own cross and follow me, I may not see you later. Now, we don't really understand that language, right? Because we don't put people on crosses anymore. But he's really dead serious about that. I know I've told this before. I get a kick out of doing it. But David Lowe's Watson was a part of the General Board of Global Ministry for a long time. He's from England. Uh, he also taught at Perkins for a bit, although I never had him. And somebody asked him one time, they said, Dr. Lowe's Watson, uh, and at the Last Supper, where do you think Jesus would be? Would it be at the head of the table? Or would it be at the foot of the table? And he answered, he said, Jesus would not be at the head of the table or the foot of the table. He'd be underneath the table washing the feet of those that were there. Servant ministry. Not one time did Jesus want to be important. <laughs> Not one time did he want to stand up and say, I'm the king of kings. He was God, right? 
He could have snapped his finger and walked out of that crucifixion. But he chose to serve, to set an example for us of what service really looks like. Now I've got to tell you, friends, these are hard things. This is, this is a hard task. If it was easy, everybody would already be doing it. But somebody's got to get started for it to catch on. You know, stuff catches on, right? I mean, boys used to wear their pants around their waist. Now they wear them, well, I don't know where they were. <laughs> you know, when I was in high school, we wore, I don't know if Harry did, but I did, I wore bell bottoms. Do you have any Harry? Yeah, mine were gold. I had a big old wide belt with a big old buckle. Yeah, shiny brown shoes had buckles on them. Yeah, we looked a little weird too. In fact, one time in Pasadena, I was uh, I came home from college and I went to Southwest Texas, for, now Texas State, which is in San Marcos, which is in the there's a whole lot of cattle and ranches and farms. Everybody out there almost wears boots, except for the hippies. They wear sandals. Merle Haggard describes that perfectly, I think, and Oki from Muskogee. And, and uh, so I came home and I was wearing cowboy boots, you know, which had changed significantly from my bell bottoms. And this guy at the gas station said, what are you doing wearing boots? None of the young people in Pasadena wear boots. Well, that isn't true either, because there's a whole group of them that did. They just didn't go to that gas station. I didn't like getting haircuts even then, so I'm walking along the quadrangle in, in Southwest Texas, and, and, and uh, so I've, I've got kind of long hair, but I'm wearing Wranglers, and I've got jeans on, I mean, Wrangler jeans, and I got boots on, and one of the, the we call them kickers, one of the kicker guys, you know, he's got a fur haircut, and, and short sleeves, and big muscles, and he just grabbed me by the nap of the neck, picked me up, and said, boy, you gotta decide. Are you one of them, or one of us? <laughs> And then I went to work for the police department, and then it was pretty decided the hippies didn't want nothing to do with me anymore. <laughs> but that's the world we're trained to live in, right? You're one or the other. <laughs> Jean Jeannie told me this morning, she's wearing her tie-dyed shirt. She said the old hippie days were coming out. <laughs> I think it looks great. I, it's okay to be individualistic. It's okay to have your own thing. But we also need to think about the good of the whole. Because until the whole community gets better, it's going to still continue to be chaotic and disturbing and crazy making. I grew up over near Garden Villas. It's close to Hobby Airport. I lived in Overbrook, which was on this side of the, the, other, uh, the other side of the bio. But... Uh, we all went to junior high, I went to elementary school, everybody I knew went to church, the same place, we all went to elementary school, we all went to Hartman Junior High School, and I would have gone to Jones had I stayed over there, but I moved to Pasadena. It was a community. They had the Garden Villas Grocery Store, the Garden Villas Pharmacy, the Garden Villas Methodist Church, Garden Villas Elementary. I want to tell you, if I'd have got a pack of cigarettes and gone out behind the Garden Villas supermarket, my mama would have known about it in about eight minutes. <laughs> Accountability. Now we're afraid to tell somebody, I saw your kids screw it up. We got two or three generations of kids that have screwed up and nobody cared. When are we going to start caring? We don't get to tutor right now up at the school, but one of the things we get to do when we're doing that is we get to hang out with kids and show them that there's somebody that cares about them, that wants them to be able to read, that loves and cares for them, even if we don't know them, even if their skin's a different color than ours even if their first language is different than ours. I'm a Star Trek fan. Some of you, there's a new Star Trek movie coming out too, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, it's not, I'm sorry, it's a, a James Bond movie, same thing. Anyway. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Spock in Star Trek, I'll never forget the scene where, where he's gonna go off to his death and he puts his hand up on the thing where James Kirk is on the other side, and he says, Captain, it's for the good of the many, not the few. That's Jesus' talk. It's for the good of the many, not the few. There's just no room in Jesus' teaching for me, 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 me. 
Well, there's room for me as a person, but not for that attitude that I'm first. We're all tuned into that radio station. Y'all know it, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? And Jesus is tuned into the one that says, what's in it for God? They might play good music on the W-I-I-F-M for a little while. We might get a new car, new boat, new house. But the what's in it for God channel, that's the one that gives us to eternity. That's the one that leads us to salvation. That's the one that's forever. And so friends, you get to turn the dial. God will know how you tune in. And we'll all experience the result when that day comes that we get to meet Him face to face. Being a fellowship follower in the fellowship of Jesus Christ is, is, is a personal thing. But it's not private. If we had a brand new restaurant open in town and you went there and the food was great, you'd tell everybody. If you go to see that 007 movie and it's great, you're going to tell everybody. If you see a great recipe and it is really good, you're going to tell everybody. Friends, we're talking about earthly stuff. The eternity that we're talking about is Jesus Christ and His relationship with you and we need to tell everybody. Not for our sake. Not so we'll have a bigger church. Not so we'll have more people in church. But so that more people get to experience eternity with Jesus Christ. Which is the whole reason He came here in the first place. It's my prayer that we turn that down a little bit. And at least maybe we can change that from me, 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 me to me, you, me, you, me, you. And then one day we'll be able to get it. That it's really not about us at all. And it never has been. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we close out our service today, I want to make an announcement. Stop that. Stop it. I appreciate Sue so much for filling in since Johnny can't be here. Uh, she's learning. Yeah, I don't know what you did. Anyway, I was talking to Jim Gottle before church today. I said, you know, why don't you come over here every Sunday? You might as well move your membership one of these days. He said, move it today. So I just want to announce that Brother Gottle is moving his membership from another Methodist church nearby to Hope Community United Methodist Church. You don't need to come up here, Jim. You're good. But let's welcome him anyway. And if today would be the day that you would unite with our church, come forward now as we sing together. We'll sing all creatures of our God.
Friends, as you're able, would you please stand? Let us pray. We pray that someday an arrow will be broken, not in something or someone, but by each of humankind to indicate peace and not violence. Someday oneness with creation rather than domination over creation will be the goal to be respected. Someday, fearlessness to love and make a difference will be experienced by all people. Then the eagle will carry our prayer and peace and love, and the people of red, white, yellow, brown, and black can sit on the same circle and communicate in love and experience the presence of the great mystery in their midst. Someday can be today for you and for me. Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace. God bless you. And we don't pass an offering plate. You might have noticed that. There's a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gifts by its offering.